Welcome. Um, my name is Michelle Klein Solomon from the International Organization for Migration and the director of the Migrants and Countries in Crisis Initiative Secretariat, which you can hear about this government led initiative in just a moment. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today for this discussion on the importance of and how to integrate migrants in disaster risk reduction and disaster management strategies. We have today participating with us from around the world uh, more than 250 people from as far away as New Zealand to the Americas. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us, including at um, challenging hours of the day. We have a very rich program ahead of us, and it is my pleasure to introduce and spend just a minute about the program today. As I said, we'll be talking about the Migrants and Countries in Crisis Initiative, which is co-chaired by the governments of the United States and the Philippines. And we're very fortunate to have with us today Ambassador Cecilia Rebong of the Philippines, the ambassador here in Geneva to the United Nations. She will be our first speaker. She will be followed immediately by two speakers from the US co-chair who are actually joining us from Washington today. One from US um, Citizen Services, Consular Affairs, working on the protection of Americans overseas. And the second from the Federal Emergency Management Administration, which works on protecting people in the United States, and in this case, migrants in the United States. Then it will be my pleasure to turn to our partner in the UN system, UNISDR, where I'm happy to have with us today, John Harding, to talk about policy development at the global level, in particular the Sendai framework for action and the integration of migrants into that. We'll then turn to our two uh, sets of expert presenters. Uh, one set joining us from California, from California State University, looking at preparedness-related uh, issues. And secondly, joining us from New Zealand, from the CLIN group, and I hope they'll tell us about what that means, um, looking at recovery-related measures on behalf of migrants um, affected by disasters. But you'll hear more from each of them. And then we'll have a moderated discussion, and you'll have an opportunity to pose questions online. I have two colleagues with me here from the Migrants and Countries in Crisis Initiative Secretariat. Tiara Milano and Lorenzo Guadagno, who are moderating this discussion and are taking questions by chat, which will then be posed to the presenters. With that, let me turn now to our first speaker, Ambassador Redbone from the Philippines. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle, and uh, well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever <laughs> you are doing with it from. I am so happy to um, join this uh, MIKIC webinar. Uh, this afternoon on a very important uh, topic, uh, very important to the Philippines. As you know, uh, the MIKIC initiative, uh, as Michelle has said, is uh, co-led by the Philippines and the United States. Um, it was born out of the need to address protection gaps for migrants who are caught in crisis, who are caught in crisis uh, when they strike or natural disasters. As we have seen and experienced, um, when many of us responded to the recent crisis in the Middle East and North Africa region. I mean, uh, by we, I mean the governments, IOs, international organizations, IOM, UNHCR, um, civil society, uh, actors, and uh, many uh, other groups. The series of Niki regional and specific stakeholders consultations so far have stressed the importance of establishing effective measures before a crisis hits to reduce the risks to which migrants are exposed in a country of destination. Now, the Philippines, with its um, 7,979,000 uh, uh, citizens overseas as of December 31, have developed some effective uh, measures or practices in this aspect. The Philippines, uh, well, at the beginning, I'd like to say the Philippines is one of the countries that worked hard, and I would say very hard, for the inclusion of uh, or reference to the role of migrants in the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction 2015-2030. I never thought that it would be that difficult. <laughs> 
The Sendai framework clearly recognizes the role of migrants in the BRR. Well, I will not go into details because uh, my colleague here, my friend from UNISDR, John, will talk about this later. But for the purpose of this webinar, I would like to share with you three examples of measures that the Philippine government has adopted to help protect or uh, prepare Filipino migrants and migrant workers when crisis hit the country where they are in. The first one is the mandatory membership of Filipino migrant workers in our social security system or and the workers' welfare fund and other protection programs prior to departure. So everybody who lives as migrant workers, who lives for abroad, they are mandated by law to um, register or uh, enroll in our social security system and in the workers' welfare fund, which um, really help uh, migrants uh, when crisis uh, happens in the countries where they are in. The second one is the mandatory pre-departure orientation seminar where those who are living for overseas employment are briefed about the country of destination where they are going, you know, the history, the culture, the customs and tradition of that particular country. They're also briefed about their rights as migrant workers, as migrants, and they are briefed about the assistance that are available to them from several Philippine government agencies abroad. Uh, this pre-departure orientation seminar uh, is normally, uh, I would say, uh, doubled, so to speak. When they arrive in their country of destination, our embassies or consulates abroad do the post-arrival orientation seminar with the same uh, features. The third one is the institutionalization of our diplomatic and consular missions abroad as a way of safety net ready to assist any and all Filipino migrants in distress abroad. The Philippines has a global network of 82 embassies and consulates, 166 honorary consulates, and at least 1,200 personnel who are mandated by law to render 24-7 services to overseas Filipinos. And I'm uh, referring to consular services, labor and welfare services, legal services, and repatriation assistance. The personnel of the embassies and the consulates and representatives of various government agencies abroad who are involved in assisting migrant communities just, uh, like the Department of um, Labor and Employment, the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration, the Department of Social Welfare and Development. Uh, yes, we employ welfare personnel um, in countries where their services are needed. They act as one country team under the leadership of the Ambassador or the Consul General. All of these personnel undergo intensive pre-departure orientation program to prepare them to provide 24-7 services to Filipinos. Philippine missions in countries where we have a big number of overseas Filipinos maintain and regularly update the database of Filipinos in their areas of jurisdiction. And I think this is very important. We have to know where everybody is so that when crisis hits, whether it's strife, political um, uh, uh, you know, strife or natural disasters, then it would be easy for this one country team to reach them and uh, help, and at the same time, ask the help of diaspora communities to assist other members of the communities. Now, aside from database of Filipinos, the missions abroad maintain contingency plans, and these contingency plans are regularly updated. In some areas, like for example in the Middle East, aside from a contingency plan, for example, in one country, we also have a sub-regional or a regional contingency plan because when, you know, when disasters hit or um, 
crisis uh, happen, then uh, and we have to repatriate or send assistance to the Filipinos. It is not only one country that is involved. You know, you have to go to other countries in the region to seek their assistance and cooperation. So contingency plans is not only for the country, for the particular country where they are in, but we have a sub-regional or a region, uh, regional contingency plans. These are just some of the examples of uh, measures which have proved to be very effective um, for uh, our efforts to extend assistance uh, to overseas Filipinos. And I would like to emphasize that this contingency class that I have mentioned involved the diaspora. We have a system where we have leaders from different Filipino community uh, groups and they, are, they undergo training and briefing also. So when disaster happens, the embassy or the consulates will call and all these leaders of the Filipino community to determine whether there are Filipinos who are affected, how to um, make sure that everybody work together to, uh, I mean, uh, ensure their safety. So, um, well, uh, as I said, uh, these measures have uh, proved to be very effective, and I think this is some of the things that we can share with other countries. Before ending my short remarks, I just want to point out that the Miki Initiative offers the opportunity for governments, civil society actors, private sector, employers and recruiters, and international organizations to enhance multi-stakeholder coordination in countries of origin, transit and destination of migrants to reduce their vulnerabilities in the face of crisis. In June this year, we hope that the drafting of the MIKIX voluntary and non-binding principles, guidelines, and practices will be finished. At that time, we will offer to all the stakeholders, we will offer this as a tool that uh, may be used by all stakeholders in responding to the protection needs of migrants caught in, crisis, in countries in crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rabong, and uh, we do all have a lot to learn from the Philippines example and preparedness. And Thank you very much. I suspect there'll be questions for you. Sure. Let me turn now to our U.S. co-chairs, to Tom Caden, who is with the American Citizen Services uh, of the U.S. Department of State from the Bureau for Consular Affairs, to be followed by Carol Cameron, who is the Director of International Affairs at the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, both in Washington. I turn over to our colleagues in Washington. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to participate on behalf of the State Department today. Um, I've been asked to give the perspective of a country of origin, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how the State Department works to build the resilience of our uh, American citizen communities overseas and, and really underline the importance of information in, in that process. Um, when a crisis hits, we want our citizens to know how to respond so that they can not only help themselves, but help each other. So information is, uh, is a really um, a major factor in what we do to try to build that resilience before a crisis hits for, for our citizens overseas. Um, the, the first one I wanted to talk about is something we call the Local Resources Initiative. Uh, this asks the question, what do U.S. citizens typically need when emergencies arise overseas, and to what extent are, are these resources available to U.S. citizens in each country? So what we've done is we've surveyed our posts overseas, our consulates and embassies, um, to, to ask what resources were available locally, including shelters, food banks, assistance for U.S. citizen children, et cetera. And we're, we're gathering that information, making it available to, to our citizens in those countries. Um, one of the great things about this program is it, it not only highlights the existing services, but it, it helps us identify gaps. We know where there are not resources available to our citizens overseas, and we're, we're encouraging our embassies and consulates to work with local partners to fill those gaps um, in resources. Uh, a second is the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program, or, or STEP. Uh, STEP allows American citizens to enroll with our embassies and consulates overseas. We've had more than 8 million U.S. citizens enroll in STEP since it began in 2004. And so when you enroll in STEP, 
you provide some contact information for the embassy, but you also uh, start receiving time-sensitive safety and security information about the country you're living in. Uh, STEP is also a really critical tool for our consular officers um, when, um, when we have a U.S. citizen that's been reported missing. It helps our consular officers to try to locate that person. So STEP is a, a very critical piece in our, in our uh, information infrastructure. And as a complement to STEP, we're also expanding our use of social media to reach our citizens with timely information. Uh, in the recent Paris uh, terror attack, um, Twitter was, was a, a major element of our um, getting our message out to our citizens in the hours and days following the attack. Uh, on Facebook, there's a, a new feature that we've been using where they, um, Facebook, whenever there's a crisis, can turn on the safety check feature that allows uh, anybody in that country that's being affected by the crisis to mark themselves as safe. This oftentimes makes it easier for family and friends back home to to uh, know that their family member is, is safe near the crisis, um, and it, it eliminates the need for the embassy to get involved in trying to locate the person so that we can um, use our resources to, to the folks that um, have not uh, been accounted for yet. Um, so social media has been a big part of that. Um, I also wanted to talk about our American Liaison Network. Um, this was formerly known as the Warden System, which is a network of private U.S. citizens that live in each country. Um, those citizens partner with our embassies and consulates to assist U.S. citizens in crisis. Now, the, the old Warden System was more of a passive uh, a passive uh, institution that would more or less pass messages from the embassy to to citizens. But what we've done with the the American Liaison Network now is we're we're trying to make it more of a continuous collaborative communication tool between our consular sections and the U.S. citizen communities uh, to understand the needs of our citizens and uh, better respond to those needs. And finally, I just wanted to talk about uh, you know our our web presence and you know what we're doing to improve the delivery of information uh, through the web. Uh, Travel.state.gov is our flagship website for providing information to the American traveling public. And what we're doing is we're redesigning the website to make it work better on smartphones and other mobile devices. Uh, we're also simplifying the consular information products that are on Travel.state.gov to make them shorter, easier to read, um, and uh, hopefully um, get the message out to our, our, our citizens. It would be easier for them to, to take in those messages when we believe they're um, designed for reading on the web. Um, and then finally, we're also redesigning each of our embassy websites. Uh, we want to make them uniform in structure so that when you go to the embassy, U.S. Embassy Buenos Aires website, if you're familiar with the structure from having used it when you went to the U.S. Embassy Rome website, for example. We want them all to be consistent and easier to navigate. So we're working hard to, to make sure that not only we have good content and good information uh, through our website, that it's going to be easier, to, um, easier for our, our citizens to access that information. So in conclusion, I mean, we, we believe all these tools uh, are going to help our citizens be better informed so that they're prepared for when a, a crisis hits. Um, and we think that having these tools um, will give them the knowledge and confidence to, to help themselves, help each other, um, to supplement the, the support that uh, our citizens receive from our embassies and consulates after uh, a crisis hits. So with that, I'll turn it over to my, my colleague, uh, Carol Cameron, from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Thank you very much, Tom. Go ahead, Carol. We'll look forward to hearing from you. Good evening. And um, as you know, every day people all across the world prepare for and face disasters, both natural and man-made. And uh, like you, FEMA really knows that the welfare and safety of hundreds, if not thousands of survivors, are often jeopardized due to their immigration status. So today I'm going to share some information from the perspective of the country of destination. And I'll touch a little bit, um, if you go to the next slide, 
on the vulnerabilities that we see with migrants, but um, also to touch a bit on people who are here legally and, uh, you know, who are full-time residents, students. We also have uh, available resources for them in times of disaster. There are a lot of uh, barriers for migrants, and they face hurdles unlike any other group that we have in the United States. Often, they do not understand the guidance that we're giving them due to uh, language barriers, and it's difficult for them to understand direction from emergency management authorities concerning evacuation. And uh, we often see that they will refuse to um, go to an evacuation site because of their legal status. They also fear taking advantage of emergency shelter and, uh, you know, once again, due to their immigration status. So one of the things that we do, we work very closely with faith-based organizations here in the United States to uh, bridge that. And uh, many migrants know that churches are safe havens where they can go in times of disaster. And um, what we also find is, regardless of the status, a lot of foreign nationals don't really understand that there are services that are available to them in the United States if a disaster strikes. All foreign nationals, regardless of their status, can receive shelter, food, water, emergency relief supplies, such as diapers and cleaning uh, supplies, and basic first aid if they're caught up in a disaster. And one of the things that your countries can do is uh, to encourage anyone who's traveling on a visa to the United States to register with their respective embassy or consulate when they get into the United States. We have a very active program with the State Department um, Counselor Services and we work closely with consulates and embassies in large cities all across the United States to make sure that uh, officials at the embassies and consulates understand what help is available for uh, their citizens who may be impacted by a disaster. And lastly, Tom was mentioning relocation um, services for American citizens abroad, but we also have relocation services here in the United States for foreign nationals who maybe um, have lost their family, perhaps someone was at work and the children were at school and they got separated. So there are relocation services. And once again, the respective embassy and consulate knows how to get in touch with those services to help impacted uh, foreign nationals. And lastly, I think the most important thing is to remind everyone that they need to know their risk and they need to know what to do. And we always encourage everyone to uh, use social media, go online, uh, take a look at the websites that are available up there for FEMA, the Red Cross, the National Hurricane Center, uh, and uh, Facebook is also a wonderful tool to use at where you, they get information from their friends and family. Many times during a disaster, we start receiving lots of calls from parents overseas who are eager to find their uh, sons or daughters who are in college. And we're finding now that if people go to Facebook, they, it's a much easier way for them to connect. <clears throat> and I think more importantly than anything else, the key to survival is evacuation. If you're directed by a local official to evacuate, you really need to do so. You need to follow those instructions and get out of the way uh, to, uh, of the disaster and the emergency responders that are coming in to help. And also, as Tom mentioned, there are many uh, smartphone applications out there that are available for all of the um, entities like the Red Cross and FEMA that people can go to to see what is available if they do get caught up in a disaster. So with that, I'll close and um, hopefully we're on time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, both Tom and, and Carol. It was um, wonderful to have both of our co-chairs of the MICIC initiative share with us uh, the many very concrete and practical steps that they are looking at, both from the perspective of countries of origin and protecting your citizens overseas, and also with respect to protecting migrants in your countries. Thank you both. With that, let me turn to our partner, John Harding from UNISDR and the UN system to talk about policy development and particularly the send-out framework at the global level. John, thank you for being with us.
Thank you, Michelle, and, and good day to all the participants. We are very appreciative to be here today to discuss this interrelation between migrants and, and, and disaster risk. Uh, I think it's a very topical issue, and I, I, I will mention in a few, in a few minutes why, why it's a topical issue, but it's also not an easy one uh, to address, and that's why we are very appreciative that IOM and, and the support of, of the governments that are, have initiated this, this, this opportunity through to make it to, to discuss and, and, and look at, at good practices uh, in, in this regard. One of the reasons why you know, it, it, it is a topical issue uh, to us is, is that last year, as, as, as mentioned by Ambassador Ribon, countries came together with, with lots of stakeholders uh, after quite a long consultative process and then they came up with, with an ambitious plan uh, framework for the next 15 years on, on, on how to address uh, disaster, disaster risk. Uh, it, it's good, useful to remind ourselves what, what, what the background to those discussions. Uh, overall, uh, while, while in countries the number of, of people who, who are, are, are dying from, from disasters globally and in most regions has actually been trending down, which is encouraging because there are effective systems in place in countries, in, 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 for example, in the Philippines, for, for, for warning, for preparing for, for populations when disaster occur. Overall, the, 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 the level of exposure and the, the number of people who, who are potentially affected uh, by disasters is trending up. And it, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the economic exposure, for example, is trending up faster than, than the economic economies are growing. So it, no, it, 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 it remains a very big concern for, for countries and, 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 and communities overall. Actually, for the first time last year, we were able to put a figure on, on, on the projected annual losses every year to disasters. Uh, and this 314 billion is, is basically what countries have to put aside every year and that, you know, we're looking forward to, to deal with the impact of disasters on, the, on, their, or on their economies. And of course, it's not just an economic issue, it's just, you know, the people are being affected. Uh, so the Sendai framework basically recognizes that, that you know, we, we, need, we, we can address this risk and we can address it through the development processes, the investments, the daily investments uh, to which risks are being increased and, 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 and fortunately we're in a position now where we have a much stronger understanding of the processes to which great risk is, is, being, is being created and therefore we can address them. The challenge for countries, of course, is when we are dealing with very dynamic environments. There are, there are, there are factors like, like climate change or population growth, which, which obviously are particularly challenging to take into consideration when, when we try looking at, at addressing disaster risk. And obviously, the movement of people is, is, is one of those dynamic, uh, those dynamic challenges that, uh, that countries are having to, to address. And that being migration, displacement, and relocation is it's, it's, it's very much part of the equation when we're talking about the efforts by countries of, of uh, managing, uh, managing their risk to disasters. The Sendai framework actually has, and, and, and through the leadership of, of, of some partners, I wonder, you know, some countries who, who, are, who are particularly cognizant of, of this, this issue, but that was quite a, you know, forward looking in how it's addressed uh, the issue of migration and displacement. And, and, and that's very encouraging. Actually, if you look over the last uh, 10 years, uh, there's been a real shift in the thinking in, of the relationship between disasters and migrants. And I, if I go back 10 years ago, we, we basically talked about displacement, basically people who were displaced when a disaster occurred. And, and, you know, and, and from then, we moved to a recognition that, that actually uh, migrants were part of the at-risk population, to, to, to a better recognition that you know, relocation is a policy option for countries to deal with risk. And, and today, if you look in the context of the Sendai framework, migrants are actually identified as an active stakeholder in, in, in the discussions, in the, in, in, in the decision-making processes that are required to, 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 to address risk. They, they can be part of the solution. And I think that, that is, that's obviously a, you know, a very encouraging and forward-looking uh, perspective now that we have um, uh, in the context of, of the standard framework, and we have to thank countries who have provided us with that, with that framework. Now, obviously, having it in the standard framework is one thing, <laughs> putting it into practice is, is you know, is obviously is, is, is quite, uh, 
quite challenging. And I think we need to take these, these good commitments and actually how we can operationalize it. And we, we, I, you know, I think the, these opportunities that we have now to, to hear some very practical examples of how that is done is a good one, and we should continue sharing those and, 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 and promoting them. Uh, it's a good start. And, and I mean, just to, to, to finish and to reflect how, how you know, some, some of the challenges that we do face, and I've actually just recently uh, spent being in, in Haiti managing one of the you know, supporting the Haitian government manage their, their, their disaster risk management program and then working with the civil protection institutions there on, 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 on putting in place their preparedness capacities, their, their warning systems and so on. And, and, and with, with, with the, the current let's say, political situation with, with the neighboring country in, in the Dominican Republic, we do have you know, quite a large uh, displaced population along, along the boundary. Uh, and it was, you know, and while we did have programs, humanitarian programs that were assisting those, those communities, it was very challenging for us to actually integrate them within the, 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 the either on the preparedness side or, or, or a longer term efforts to, to build the, the, the resilience of, of, of the Haitian uh, population. Um, and, and that was both because of dynamics within, within the, the, the government, but also you know, the dynamics within our institute, international uh, in, institutions. Um, and, and of course, it would, uh, so not only when, when I was there, we were fortunate that you know, Haiti wasn't affected by a large hurricane this year, but you know, it was not too bad. I can tell you that if it had, they would have been on, on the first line. And, and, and not, none, of our, none of our plans, none of our warning systems what had, were targeting them. Uh, so, so I know we could, this issue will, will fortunately come up in the next hurricane season, and hopefully we'll have made some progress. But also, it was a really missed opportunity because these are people who had spent their whole lives living in the Dominican Republic. They, they speak uh, Spanish, they don't speak the local language, and they also come from a country that is quite advanced in their, in their, their approaches and have probably quite a lot to contribute to the local community too in, in, uh, when it comes to understanding how to address risk in that specific context. So I think just, I just want to use that as an example to say that you know, you know, it's very encouraging to have this in their framework because we have a real challenge in putting that in place through our sort of collective. Uh, Thank you very much, John. Um, I, Sendai is a, is a watershed moment, there's no question, and uh, I, I actually had the good fortune to get with Lorenzo to be part of the Sendai team to, to help work with governments and others to integrate migrants. And um, I th thought your, your challenge to us to really work toward implementation is the key. And I thought your presentation particularly noted that not only are, do migrants have specific vulnerabilities and may be missed in disaster preparedness and measures and response, but they can also be key factors in reducing risk and managing risk. And that's, that's a core message I think we all need to take away. Thank you very much. Let me now turn to the third segment of our session today to invite our local practitioners to talk both first about preparedness-related measures and then recovery measures. On the preparedness side, we're fortunate to have with us today Onane Martinez, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. She joins us from uh, San Marcos, California State University in San Marcos. She's an associate professor of anthropology, working with the National Latino Research Center. Hopefully we'll have her CV available online so you can learn more about her. But you have the floor, Madam, and uh, we look forward to you. Yes, good morning, and thank you all for um, your attention and your invitation to participate this morning. Um, I'm really honored to be part of an international um, event like this with colleagues um, around the world. Today, I'm going to be talking about um, our experience here in Southern California with the 2007 wildfires that happened um, that really shook um, our work as researchers and agency members who work with immigrant communities in the border region um, to its core. We were um, obviously in a period of chaos during this time, and it really made us realize the importance of preparing for disaster, uh, not only for ourselves, but for the communities that we are working with. And these, in this case, it was immigrant farm workers from um, the Southern California region. As my colleagues who have uh, spoke already this, um, today have already emphasized, immigrant are especially vulnerable 
as a whole on a day-to-day basis. And in times of disaster, these vulnerabilities are even more pronounced. And these are just a few of the, the highlights of some of the vulnerabilities for immigrants in Southern California. Uh, very similar to what my colleagues have already mentioned. Uh, a sense of isolation, uh, high poverty levels, which put people at risk daily. Um, immigration status as well, which was mentioned uh, by our FEMA representative, is a huge barrier for immigrants living in the border region here, from primarily from Mexico. Um, they also face inequalities and a lack of access to services, uh, health care services, social service agency um, service as well. There is a huge culture of fear in Southern California due to the fact that a lot of um, our community residents don't have um, Im- uh, authorized citizenship or uh, residents here in the United States. And not only that, there's a large um, history and ongoing issue of racism and discrimination against immigrants here uh, due to the large undocumented uh, immigrant community that we have. And finally, the um, a lot of a lack of awareness among agencies, which really became pronounced during the wildfires. Now, our work prior to um, the fires, we had been working um, on a large grant that allowed us to do some community organizing. And we are a coalition called the Farm Worker Care Coalition here in San Diego County. Um, it's an, a coalition of, a, of close to probably over 30 agencies, from researchers to um, community clinics, to the Red Cross, to um, housing agencies, clinics, like I said. We were founded in 2004, and prior to the wildfires, we had been doing some community organizing where we were training immigrant farm workers to be leaders in their own communities and to um, take initiative to help educate and inform their fellow community residents on their rights um, to legal health services, as well as Um, other health issues. When the fires hit in 2007, as I mentioned before, um, it was a very chaotic time, Um, 10 days of this disaster. Um, As a coalition, we were um, obviously trying to make sure our own families were secure during this time, but we quickly started getting uh, reports from the field that um, the farm worker communities were especially vulnerable, were being um, evacuated but didn't know where to go, Um, We're being asked for ID and and shelters. We're being turned away from services that they should otherwise have access to, as our colleague mentioned. But when a chaos ensues like this, oftentimes, you know, the reality is that people are denied services and and things happen that um, deny people their basic civil rights during um, a disaster. There were um, about five areas of uh, impact that I'm going to quickly go over because I think we've already talked about some of these issues. Uh, one was being the, the obvious lack of preparedness among immigrants due to their already invisible um, status in our society here in the United States. Um, and also, when we get ideas about how to prepare, when you ask uh, a community resident who's a working poor person to have $200 um, cash with them and extra medication in the event of a disaster, it's not really a very realistic expectation. The evacuation was um, quite uh, disastrous here, literally in um, Southern California with people at at stops like this one here in this picture. The border patrol was highly present during evacuation, which was very intimidating to people who were undocumented. And in some cases, people would um, choose to stay inside their house during an evacuation rather than expose themselves to possibly being deported. Um, Within... um, Within the shelters, there was a huge lack of cultural sensitivity. Um, People were being asked for the identification. Again, a huge barrier for those community residents who um, don't have their documentation here. Um, So what happened was a lot of people didn't use the shelters, and instead they went and they relied on their own networks. And their own networks of houses and apartments, and so you had people um, in their own homes with 10, 20 people also there, and they quickly ran out of food and resources as well. Um, As a result of the the wildfires, there was a lot of impact economically because people lost work. Some people lost their homes entirely when they were burnt down. Uh, People lost access to food and water and had a lot of um, mental health and, and coping issues as well. 
So what emerged, and I quickly just went over sort of what happened here in, in San Diego. Um, what emerged from this was that we quickly realized as an, a coalition that uh, we had to do more during disaster because it was evident that the local authorities and the emergency management um, groups in San Diego were not familiar with the special vulnerabilities faced by immigrants, and they were unprepared to answer and to to handle the, the special needs of this community in the times of disaster. And so we set out to, first we documented the issues, and then we got some funding from the state of California to, to prepare um, an emergency preparedness plan uh, for immigrant farm workers in San Diego. And we have six strategies that we focused on to help our capacity, because we quickly realized that we can't do it all, that we need to um, work with uh, FEMA, we need to work with the Office of Emergency Services and with the Red Cross here in San Diego. So we quickly built our partnerships um, and we were quickly told by the Office of Emergency Services and the Red Cross that if we wanted to be a part of um, a larger preparedness plan, that we needed to um, use the same structure that agencies here in the United States use from the very top to the local level, which is called an incident command structure. And I'll go into that in a few minutes. Um, so building our partnerships was very important. Um, during the fires, we realized that we can't do it all. Like I said before, we were collecting food, we were doing all we could, and we realized that we're, we're not equipped to do some of these things where other agencies are. So we realized we needed to find the partners who are specialized in those areas. Another thing that we did was we started to work with the community health workers, the community outreach workers that have been part of this grant to involve them in this process. And the things that we did was we um, developed an emergency preparedness curriculum for immigrant farm workers, very tailored specifically to this community to help um, increase their capacity to be prepared in disaster. And we used a train the trainer type uh, model where these community health workers were trained to deliver this curriculum um, among their, their friends and, and family members in the communities most vulnerable. Um, we also involved the community in training, like CPR first aid, like you can see here, um, a community emergency response team, and they've actually created their own community res emergency response team um, in one of the local communities here. And they have the gear and the training to respond during disaster, to do um, basic first aid, to help people who are trapped, other types of emergency um, things until um, first responders can get there. And we also educated them on their rights during a disaster because a lot of people don't know what their rights are as far as access to services and that they can't be denied um, aid and services based on their documented status. We also had to advocate for the community with um, not only uh, disaster providers, but local agencies, um, get the information out there about the special barriers to services and the barriers that immigrants face during disaster. We built up our assets and we created an asset map to help uh, build our capacity and have um, linkages with churches, with ethnic media like radio stations and television that can be a, an asset to us during a disaster to get information out. Food banks, fire stations, all of these things were part of our um, asset building. We also tried to build our own capacity. This is probably one of the biggest accomplishments of our coalition, which was to develop an incident command structure structured to our community of immigrants here in San Diego. Um, we did, we've done simulations. We worked closely with the Office of Emergency Services in San Diego County, as well as the Red Cross, who helped us develop um, our incident command structure. And what basically this is, for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's, it's a basically a, um, a, a chain of command during a disaster that's used, like I said, all the way from FEMA down to a local emergency with the fire department. And this provides clear roles and um, a chain of command for disasters so that you're not um, completely unorganized like we were in 2007, and uh, which can be very overwhelming and ineffective. And so as you can see, down at the very uh, bottom where the red uh, boxes are, these divisions that we have listed here are actually community health workers who are actual immigrants in the community, part of the structure, who work on the local level to get information out and to assess issues and they communicate that all the way up through the chain of command. And then things are coordinated at the top with Office of Emergency Services, with the Red Cross to get aid out or whatever needs to happen um, so that we're organized for the next disaster. Here's just an example of one of our, um, our job action sheets for one of these roles. And we have these for each role in our, in our, in our structure. 
um, we finally had to make sure that if we build this plan, are we going to get um, the cooperation and the buy-in from the office of emergency services, from um, local police officers, from fire departments? So they're aware that we're organized and that we're, they're aware that we want to be part of this um, to make sure that people don't get and fall from the cracks like they did during 2007. So some of the lessons learned I wanted to share with you, um, just to sort of remind you, is that all of our one agency can't do it all. You have to work in collaboration and a coalition like we have. Um, immigrants will be disproportionately affected, just as they are daily and vulnerable in many um, of countries around the world. In disaster, it's more pronounced, and you should expect that. Um, things get chaotic, and it will be a mess, but the more organized you can get, the better. It's key to involve the community in any plans. And um, from the bottom up, they have um, a lot of to contribute and should be an integrate part of any sort of emergency plan. Um, it's key to build your partnerships now. Rather than in the middle of a disaster, you're not going to have time to find out what assets that you might need. Um, we, I really encourage making a plan and keeping it updated. We have a plan that we, des we, des that we designed. Um, but already, I can tell you that 60% of the people on that incident command structure have moved on to other positions or their grants are no longer exist, and so they're not integrally involved in this topic anymore. So you have to continually look for partners. You have to continually update your personnel, um, keep training, and keep that contact with the community. And I just wanted to thank you for um, your time. We have a series of reports. We have an actual copy of the Disaster Preparedness Plan, if you'd like to see it, on our website as well as the report um, that looks at sort of the impacts on the local immigrant communities. And we have a short video on YouTube about our coalition and some of the work that we've done in this area, if you'd like to check that out. So thank you very much for your time and I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much for your presentation. That was excellent and I think uh, responds exactly to what Joan said, which is we really need to translate into reality um, the, the goals, the objectives that were set out at Sendai, and this is a fantastic example of learning from a difficult experience and, and learning well. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Let me move now to a different part of the world, clearly across the world, actually, um, to the Kling Group, to Wayne Reed and Sally Carlton, who will make a joint presentation focused uh, not as we just did on the preparedness phase, but specifically on the recovery phase. You have the floor. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, good morning, everybody, or maybe good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'd also like to mention that we've got Sarah Thompson with us as well, um, who's one of the representatives on Kling from the Pacific communities. Um, so Kaling is a collaboration, uh, much like our colleague previously was saying. Um, we also realize that it's necessary to work together. Uh, so the groups that are involved in Kling are a whole mix of agencies, um, including local and central government agencies, uh, migrant and refugee support groups, um, health agencies, and other groups such as interpreting services, um, the Human Rights Commission, Plains FM, which is a community radio station. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, these are some of the acronyms we might use, um, called particularly culturally and linguistically diverse, um, is the term that's used uh, in New Zealand to refer to communities not necessarily speaking English and from different cultural backgrounds. Um, next slide, please. Can we go to, thank you. Um, so just a bit of context then. Uh, in September 2010, there was a 7.1 magnitude earthquake here. Um, which caused quite a lot of damage to particularly underground infrastructure and weakened some of the buildings. But um, one, of the, one of the key learnings is that we didn't learn too much from that earthquake. Um, and, then, and then less than six months later, there was a second earthquake of lesser magnitude, but caused significantly more damage um, lots of buildings destroyed and 185 people lost their lives. Um, and then there were more than 15,000 aftershocks in the period since September 2010, um, including some major aftershocks in June and December 2011. And um, our most recent uh, big aftershock was just two weeks ago, actually, another 5.7 earthquake. And, and we wanted to mention that to kind of highlight that 
this is still ongoing and some of the mental health issues in particular um, keep being brought up by these ongoing seismic activity. Next slide, please. Don't want to uh, touch too much on demographics, but uh, around 11.7% of the wider Christchurch area comes from a non-English speaking background. And we've included Pacific peoples, Asian, and of course the Middle East and Latin American and African group, most of whom are from refugee backgrounds. Um, it is around um, 46,000 people. We have around 170 cultures and 80 different languages being spoken in Christchurch, which does um, present a major headache in communication. Next slide, please. The, we had a meeting at one of the local Maori meeting places. Everybody seemed to gravitate this, to this area three weeks, uh, sorry, three days after the event. One of the um, uh, logistical difficulties that we came across that most people had lost their databases that were on hard drives that were in buildings that were either damaged, destroyed, or just not able to access. Um, I know several people have been talking about um, communication. We found that mobile phone networks were very erratic and often down, so we were left with no distribution at all. We were trying to get information out to the communities because of the damaged infrastructure it was almost impossible to get, get into some of the communities. Um, information, um, sorry, one size doesn't fit all, and this goes back to the difference in cultures. Translating and interpreting, we were very fortunate that the local Canterbury District Health Board, which is the District Health Board for this entire area, gave us an open check, which um, we could have run away with and did a lot of um, uh, interesting stuff, but it was actually used. We, in fact, didn't need to worry about the bureaucracy or having to actually ask for permission to do something. We just got out there and did it. And that was a huge godsend to all of us working in this area. One of the major findings was this, um, if you want to communicate well with core communities following a disaster, don't wait until something really bad happens. Get to know them now, build a relationship with core communities based on mutual trust, respect, and understanding. Next slide, please. Cultural expectations around, around health. Um, we found that pe many people, most people from refugee backgrounds, had this inbuilt um, reaction to flee. And once they found out that there were recovery centres, they actually managed to make their way to one in particular um, where we were able to deal with a lot of the issues um, altogether. But one of the things that was very important here is that the storage of food and water amongst people coming into this country is not common. Whereas if you're brought up in New Zealand, most of us do have food and water stored in a garage or somewhere that is easily accessible. But the um, assumption that migrant and refugee communities are more vulnerable in the time of an earthquake, we found it not necessarily true. Um, because they're collective cultures, they seem to coalesce around their own cultures and in, so, in doing so, they were actually able to help themselves. Culturally learned responses, I mean, for example, in China, um, people are taught uh, in an earthquake to get out of a building, which is totally opposite to what you do, do in New Zealand. And we did have instances here of Chinese people and some Asian people actually running straight out and falling down sinkholes. Nobody lost their lives through that, but it was something that people actually, um, that we hadn't thought of before. But one of the really neat things that happened in many of these communities was young people taking on leadership roles just automatically, because in many cases, the young people's um, grasp of English was very positive. So that was a major plus that we hadn't actually planned on. So coming then to what we've been doing um, after the response phase, um, one of the things that Kling has done is worked on putting together this best practice guidelines. Um, and it's basically, Kling primarily worked through and for communication with these groups. So coming then to what we're doing now in the next slide, please. Um, some of the challenges that we've faced uh, since this disaster response phase is um, ongoing mental health and well-being issues um, among migrant communities and also among the local communities as well. And as I mentioned earlier, the um, ongoing earthquakes are contributing to some of these difficulties. Um, since the earthquakes, the demographics of Christchurch have changed immensely. Um, and we'll see a slide later with some of those statistics. Um, and with that's coming some racism. Uh, interestingly, despite the lessons that we feel we've learnt, 
we're still having huge problems with funding and resourcing, interpreting and translated resources, despite having shown their importance. Um, and we're also having issues with agencies not knowing what resources are already translated and not knowing what's out there and how to access them. It's just interesting, the, um, and Ambassador Reep Fong um, may be interested, of the people in the Greater Christchurch site who, um, area who were born in Ireland, 54.5% arrived after the earthquakes. The Filipino population increased by 31% since the earthquakes, and the Indian population by 37%. All of these people are coming in to help with um, cleanup, rebuild, um, and our Filipino population in particular is growing very, very rapidly at the moment, and that's bringing its own issues with it, um, particularly around the way of uh, communication. Next slide, please. Um, nonetheless, uh, despite these challenges, there have been some huge opportunities that have come out of the experiences we've had. The primary one being the collaboration between different groups and the support that um, the sector has got through this collaboration is incredibly important. Um, because of the lessons that we've learned and the experiences we've had uh, and the collaboration that's been formed, we feel like we're better prepared now because we have built those relationships that we feel are really important. Um, there, have been some improvements in terms of knowing about the importance of communication with cold communities. Um, and so despite the yeah, despite the challenges, there definitely have been some improvements. And I think uh, we try and hang on to those as much as possible. Yes, the, on, the ongoing aftershocks um, actually are seen as a positive in some ways because they keep reminding people that um, we still have a long way to go to get out of this. Just a couple of other things that we found to be very important, and that's health literacy or literacy across the board. And so far as so much of the communication that came out initially was targeted at a reading age of 18, which is university reading age, which actually goes over the heads of most people, and they should actually be targeted at a reading age of 12 or 13. And this is very important when you're actually looking at translating material. Um, we got involved very early with translating public health information because, uh, just as a small example, our major river through Christchurch was heavily polluted with E. coli and a host of other not particularly nice um, bacteria. And this leads straight out into the ocean where we found people from non-English speaking backgrounds were fishing quite happily off the wharves, not knowing that the ocean around there was heavily contaminated. So that was actually um, corrected by putting up a sign at the end of the walls translated into several different languages. So it's just simple things like that that we actually learned very quickly. We've got to be able to communicate with people in their own language and don't assume that people actually speak or read English. It's one of the areas where people that have English as a second language, is that, and after a disaster, people actually prefer to be able to communicate in their mother tongue because trying to actually figure things out in a second language doesn't actually work. Now, there are three or four other slides at the end of this, which we won't go through, but for those people who do have access to the slides, some of, uh, there's a slide there which has um, access to a number of published uh, research papers that have come out of the Canterbury um, experience, and also a couple of copies of um, pamphlets that we had done that were targeted specifically at agencies to uh, um, get them uh, involved in being prepared for a disaster for people from these non-English speaking backgrounds. So thank you for all your time and thank you for the invitation to be part of this. It's been lovely. Thanks to you both. Thanks for sharing your experience um, with the earthquakes in Christchurch, which unfortunately are continuing, and especially your lessons learned. There's some very good resonance between your messages not only with the two expert presentations, but what we're learning overall in the MICIC initiative about the importance of preparedness measures and very explicitly reaching down into local communities and building trust and networks and communication means in regular times so that those can be activated when a crisis hits. And it's too late when you're in the emergency phase to think about trying to build those networks. Trust is a real issue with a culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Thank you for that acronym for us. 
Um, I, I think it's it's uh, very much goes to the barriers that John was talking about, and that these are real barriers, these are real hurdles, but they're possible to overcome with good planning and really reaching into local networks to build that trust, to build those relationships for better preparation. Those are key messages here. Let me just ask uh, my colleagues whether we have time to take some questions from the floor. Yes. Do we? Okay. Um, let me turn to Lorenzo, perhaps, to uh, pose some of the questions that have come in by email. And as he's getting ready to do that, I want to um, call your attention to an issue brief that is on the Migrants and Countries in Crisis website that specifically looks at this issue and trying to look at um, the the, the interrelationship between migrants and disasters and the particular vulnerabilities that are faced, the fact that absolutely not one size fits all, and the kinds of specific measures that can be taken with lots of examples. So we will show in a minute the, the slide with the website um, address uh, that also includes a place where you can share your practices. And this is a call going out to all of the participants in today's webinar, I think um, we do need platforms for sharing good practices. We need platforms where people can communicate and learn from one another, raise the awareness that then makes it possible to actually prepare better going forward. Lorenzo, go ahead. And here's up on the screen now, we'll leave this up, is the, is the website and specifically the share practice um, uh, component where you can share your examples and uh, with the opportunity to learn from one another. But Lorenzo, go ahead with some of the questions that have come in from our participants. So we have had a few that came in before the webinar that are really, uh, I think, they could really complement what's been said by the various speakers. Uh, one of them is what incentives and benefits exist for host institutions and communities to adopt an inclusive approach towards planning for migrants in crisis? Uh, and the other side of it, so uh, in light of the increasing levels of, of xenophobia at global level, how can one motivate migrants who may feel victims of exclusion to take part in disaster risk reduction efforts? And in particular, how to reach out to invisible migrants? Um, and there's a third one that I think um, it, it, it's also really interesting. So what can volunteers, local emergency service groups, and other individuals in the migrants' host communities do in order to contribute to these efforts? Um, so um, I, I don't know who can uh, take these questions, but maybe it would be interesting to have, uh, since we have representatives from the host government and the host communities and uh, from the home countries, it would be interesting to have uh, a mix of those, so maybe if the speakers want to uh, reply to any of that, um, you can just show your hands on the screen uh, for the distant ones. Or Perhaps uh, that would be up for Ambassador Rabon an opportunity, if you would like, um, yeah. to, to address. So the questions were, and thank you very much, Lorenzo, were what incentives and benefits are there for host communities to adopt an inclusive approach to include migrant immigrant communities in disaster risk reduction and dis disaster management um, planning and mechanisms? And um, particularly, and secondly, the flip side of that is with rising xenophobia in so many areas, how do you um, encourage and motivate migrants to actually participate in disaster risk reduction in the services that are available from governments at all, at all levels? And then finally, what can volunteers do to help um, and, and at all levels? So let me turn to Ambassador Rebon first and then perhaps to our expert speakers. Okay, thank you very much, very briefly. Incentives for host communities, I think there's one basic principle that is involved here. It is a social responsibility. It is a humane, uh, I would say, responsibility for host communities to involve migrants. Make sure that they know what services are available to them. Make sure that they are part of uh, their art planning and they are aware of uh, how to take care of themselves because at the end, I think, you know, it's just one community. Uh, you cannot uh, separate nationals or your citizens from migrant communities. Uh, you really have to do it. I, I can't think of any other reason 
uh, why the host community should be involved in migrant communities in this effort. Um, how to reach out to invisible, especially invisible migrants, where this is where really trust, uh, you, it's a special effort. Everybody has to reach out. Governments of sending states, for example, the Philippines, now in our case, our missions abroad are really mandated to reach out, to explain, to know where are the Filipinos are. To uh, host communities, they have to have agencies just like, you know, what they have uh, presented to us in New Zealand, in California, uh, at the national level, by FEMA. Uh, they have to reach out and explain and, and I think give the message that when a disaster happens, everybody is protected. Everybody has access to uh, assistance. That there is no difference between citizens or permanent residents or migrants, even uh, migrants in uh, irregular uh, situation. So there are many agencies, uh, missions, voluntary groups, church groups, civil society um, groups can do this. And um, that links me to the role of the volunteers. I think this is the most important thing. Let the migrant communities know that they are part of uh, assistance, that they have access to services, that they can approach uh, government agencies and civic societies who can help them in times of crisis. It's this, I mean, you know, uh, everybody has to set extra effort. We have to reach out. Because these migrants will not come out in the open, as everybody has said. You know, in California, in uh, New Zealand, invisible migrants, so to speak, they are afraid because of their uh, situation. They, even if they want to be saved, you know, uh, like the professor has said, uh, some communities in California are being asked to, you know, to leave uh, their, their residences, but they are afraid to be exposed in the open because they fear that they would be but are uh, repatriated to their countries or, or charged, criminally charged. So uh, we have to differentiate really between, make sure that humanitarian systems uh, and all these systems are available to them, irrespective of their migration status. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rivon. Let me turn to our U.S. co-chairs. Uh, Tom and Carol, would either of you like to take the floor and offer some thoughts about the, the three baskets of questions that were asked? Well, uh, this is Tom. I, I'm going to actually um, let Carol, I think, respond. It looks like uh, it sounds like we're talking about um, the migrant communities uh, in, in responding to a crisis. Carol, Carol, I don't know if you have something. Um, yes, I know that there are a number of efforts underway, as uh, one of the other speakers talked about locally, where uh, state and local governments are reaching out to um, members of migrant communities to work with them directly on um, preparedness, response, and recovery activities. In addition to that, every time there is a major disaster, such as the one that happened in New York City, Hurricane Sandy, FEMA does, uh, you know, a very wide look at the demographics of the area so that we're sure we have native speakers to be able to go out and work in that community with the survivors so that we're sure they're getting um, the care and uh, resources that they need. Thank you very much, Carol. Let, let me ask our expert um, participants here. Our colleagues in Christchurch, would you like to offer any thoughts at this moment? Please go ahead. Just, just a couple of things. Um, one of the, uh, talking about volunteers, is particularly amongst our people from refugee backgrounds, um, many of them started form, forming themselves into groups and just got stuck into things like cleaning up uh, liquefaction. None of them waited to be asked, and that was quite... Um, almost unusual because many people from these backgrounds don't come from countries where volunteers uh, are well known or the concept is not well known. But actually doing it and others are actually feeding, um, cooking food for feeding other volunteers. 
As far as the xenophobia is concerned, we mentioned, um, again, with the Islamic communities, they've made great efforts over the last six months or so to create um, platforms where people can actually visit mosques. Um, our Afghani community late last year organised a function where over 500 people turned up. Um, and that was extraordinarily successful just to actually try and get on top of some of the awful things that have been well, portrayed in the media, if you like. So there are some very positive things that have come out of this um, that probably wouldn't have happened if this had not ha occurred. And just to add in one comment to the, um, the incentives or benefits for governments, there has to be, I imagine, economic benefits. If you translate material into languages other than English, the cost of doing that is significantly less than the cost of dealing with people with bacterial disease, for example. I mean, that's just looking at it purely in terms of economics. Thank you both very much. Let me turn to Konade in uh, California to see if there's anything you would like to add. I'll just add a, I'll just add a quick um, comment about the xenophobia question and the that kind of builds upon the lack of awareness at the local level of um, like in the in the shelters, for example, during the fires, although we have clear policies with the Red Cross and with um, emergency services and FEMA that discrimination is not allowed, that it, it's obviously a policy that's on the books. But when you're in a situation where you have untrained um, workers and outreach volunteers, like for the Red Cross, for example, who don't know these policies, these things don't get um, enforced during disaster. So I think there's a larger um, need for training of um, people in in the volunteer parts of um, disasters who are not necessarily familiar with the issues of discrimination in the communities um, that are especially vulnerable to these issues. So I think it's a, a training question is very important to talk about that. In California, in Southern California, it, I mean, it's um, very tense here at the border for uh, Mexican immigrants who are highly undocumented on a daily basis and even more pronounced, like I said before, during disaster. So the xenophobia thing is something that over, overshadows every, everything that with good intentions in many cases. And so um, things get quite ugly in, in crisis situations here as well. Thank you very much for that. Um, please, of course, Ambassador Rigo, um, I, I remember because I heard uh, some of our participants uh, mention about um, reaction of uh, relief workers like the Red Cross. I think the, the briefing or the reaching out does not uh, involve only reaching out to the migrant communities. We have to reach out to local authorities. The, you know, briefing for members of the community that, uh, you know, in times of crisis, they, uh, ordinary citizen of a particular county or a particular um, state, they have to know that everybody should be protected. So that, you know, this raise this name and all, uh, you know, like classification, because we need the, all the members of the community to know that everybody has to be assisted. So not only migrant communities, we have to reach out, we have to do information campaign to everybody in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rebel. And I think that's a perfect note to close on. Let me just offer three or four quick um, uh, overview points, perhaps as takeaways. One, you have all stressed the importance of preparedness, of developing contingency plans, testing and updating them very regularly, um, that people move, people change, and that that level of, uh, is such a need to build awareness and continually to test that. Um, secondly, you all mentioned the importance of networks and building trust to overcome fear, and that fear is, is a major barrier when we're talking about migrant communities, and particularly migrants in an irregular situation, who of course need to be protected and assisted in the same way as nationals, but who may face very real barriers in doing so. So those networks of trust have to be built in, in regular times, and messages have to go out consistently um, to say, that they are eligible for and, and, um, and have access to um, emergency services when emergency arises, regardless of status. Um, 
debunking those myths and debunking some of the stereotypes to reduce barriers is, is a key part of that. And, and training, as was just highlighted, is one of the key ways to do that. that it, it's not enough to have a central government policy, which obviously is the first step and a critical step, but people need to be trained in it all the way down the chain to the local level to have that be effective. Last two points is that um, collaboration was seen by all of you as absolutely essential uh, between governments um, at the, the federal, the national, the local level, with civil society, church, migrant organizations, with individual community leaders and, and, and really tapping them. And finally, uh, my last point that, that you've all made is that, of course, migrants face um, additional vulnerabilities beyond citizens but they also can be uh, tremendously empowered and empowering in helping others if we give them the means. So we should not simply assume vulnerability across the board, but really see migrants and, and different communities as possibly empowering and helpful in, in disaster preparedness and response. I think those are very important, very uh, positive messages for, for us to end our discussion on today. And it's just today. I, I hope that this is not the end of the discussion, but a beginning of one and a continuing one. And let me just thank all of our presenters and speakers from governments, from partner UN agencies, from uh, communities on the ground who are working with migrants, studying um, directly the experiences, learning lessons, putting into place practices to actually overcome the barriers and, uh, and create better protection and assistance. Thank you all very much for joining us today. And uh, as I said, please look at the MIPIC website. You can share your practices, take a look at the issue brief. We'd love to hear from you and keep this discussion going. Thank you very much for your time.